Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. It is Monday, October 12th. And on my Google calendar, it says two things. Just want to make sure everyone gets this. Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day. So it's both. Whatever you are actually celebrating, we wish you a happy, whichever one. Um, now for everyone else, uh, most of you are working anyway, because it's not as if offices are usually closed for Columbus day, but I think some schools are. So maybe you're home with your kiddos and this is the way you escape. I hope so for your sake, if you've got a financial question and we are part of your escape plan, just send us an email. It's ask Jill at Jill on Ask Jill at Jill on Okay, let's start with Christine, who says, hello, we are three years into a fixed mortgage on a second home. We're considering switching to an interest only mortgage. Our small business income has decreased due to the current state of the country. We're looking to increase our cash flow, decrease our monthly expenses. Would you recommend this path or is an interest only mortgage always too much of a risk? <sighs> Christine, it's not always too much of a risk, but... I need to know more information. I feel like we need to understand, number one, what is the value of the home? Number two, what is the outstanding mortgage amount? The fixed mortgage, it is, is it a 10, a 15, a 30-year? Do you have an existing mortgage on a primary residence? What does the cash look like? All of these things would help us address your question. And I just don't know. I don't. So I need more information. For those of you who are enticed by the low monthly payments of an interest-only mortgage, sounds like a great idea, but rates are so low already. It might be time to actually fix those rates, just make it a longer term. Maybe, maybe, of course, that means that you will have the mortgage longer, but it might have some stability. Look, interest rates are staying low for the foreseeable future. And I believe that's the case with both longer term, intermediate term, and short term. But there's definitely a risk, especially if you intend to hold this home for a long time. Okay, James writes, my wife and I are 37. We make just under $150,000. We both have pensions and we max out Roth IRAs. And I contribute an additional 15 to 20% to my Roth 457. Wow. They're 37. They have 600 grand in retirement accounts and $170,000 in cash. Oh my God. With low interest rates, should we take $105,000 from cash to pay off our condo? It's worth about 340 grand. Also, when do you know that you've saved enough in a 529 plan? My two-year-old son currently has 53 grand in his 529. It's invested in Vanguard index funds. Okay. The way you know enough is you just go to a college planning calculator. And I presume that um, if you're saving for college, you've got all this great savings already that um, you know that the, the benefits of the 529 are that if you use the money for college, no tax when you take it out. It may be that you have enough already if you're use, planning on doing a public university. I think you might need a little bit more if you want to pay for a fully pay for a private, but I don't know. I wouldn't go too crazy either. Run the numbers. Let's see if you've saved enough. Okay. In terms of the cash, how much of that cash needs to stay liquid? That's your first question. So I don't know, maybe it's 50. I don't know if you should pay off the condo. It depends on the rate of the mortgage. And generally speaking, you know, if you're you're just making your payments and everything's good, I wouldn't pay it down. I would probably just open a brokerage account and go from there. So I hope that's helpful. Okay, Ronald writes, how to fire a financial planner and find a new one. That's the subject. We are currently working with a financial planner, but he's not doing a very good job. He currently has us in several alternative investments that cannot easily be converted to other investments, meaning they're illiquid. We're heavily invested in non-publicly traded REITs that are doing poorly. Okay, so I need to fire my current planner, find a new one who will help uh, get us out of these investments in something new that will grow in value for the next 10 to 15 years. We're retired. We have about $330,000 in a combination of Roth and traditional IRAs. We do not need this money for current income. I do need the money to grow for future expenses. We don't have any long-term care insurance. I am currently 74. My wife is 69. We are both in good health. Okay. So the first thing is we're going to have to find you an advisor. 
you can find an advisor in a couple of different ways. You can ask people you know, all right? So you can ask some of your neighbors, you can ask uh, your tax preparer, you can ask maybe if you have a lawyer, but you can also go to NAPFA, N-A-P-F-A, NAPFA.org. That is basically a community of fee-only advisors, meaning they cannot take any commissions. And maybe you can find someone who will help you do the work that needs to be done on a project basis. You can also go to the CFP website, letsmakeaplan.org. That is another idea. You know, you can fire the person very easily. You don't have to do this right away. But I think that the easiest way to fire a financial person is to do it in writing and to make sure that you close the door so that that person doesn't come back around and try to actually save the relationship. I would also suggest you go to our website, jillonmoney.com. And when you go onto the website, you go to the resources section and you scroll down and you'll see that we have a post up there. Need an advisor? Here's 13 questions to ask. We also have the um, links to the letsmakeaplan.org, to the NAPFA, to the CPA PFS website. So there's CPAs who do financial planning. All those things are right on our website. This is one of those things that I think is incredibly important, by the way. And that is that when you have someone who is suggesting that you buy certain investments, one of your questions is about liquidity. How quickly can I convert this to cash? And, you know, this is a terrible lesson in, boy, I should have asked more questions on the way in. Okay. This is from Sam Anonymous. Hi, Jill and Mark. I've been a voracious listener of the show since the pandemic began. Thank you for the useful, thought-provoking information with the generous helping of humility and kindness. I have a personal financial question for you. I'm purchasing my sister's share of my late grandparents' house for $40,000. She, along with other members of my family, would like to cash out now and not join the LLC that's being set up for the rental property going forward. My sister just turned 18, recently started college, is living at home until the pandemic gets better, and my mom has graciously offered to pay her tuition costs for her undergraduate degree. My sister is eager to start investing, unsure where to start. As I'm older than she is by over a decade, I want to help her learn some financial discipline by perhaps giving her 20 grand at once for her to put into a low cost mutual fund with Vanguard. Then I could pay her a monthly sum with interest so she can budget living expenses while herself setting aside some money for savings. Just trying to, just so sweet. I just love this. She's, uh, he's trying to form good habits now before she starts working full time. How would you recommend she approach the situation as she is keenly self-aware of the dangers of handing cash to a very young, financially illiterate adult? Many thanks. Well, I mean, I think you've got a good game plan, which is I think that you make the money go into an account directly. You can set it up so you send money directly to her and then, and I don't mean to her, I mean to like a separate account. And then from that account, the money can go dollar cost average into the Vanguard fund. Um, and so I think that that's a, that may be the best idea, but look, it's her money. She's 18. If she wants to blow it, she actually can blow it. So remember that part of this is trust and getting her involved. Part of it is trying to make it as easy as possible for her not to go in and get that money and spend it like crazy. All right. But what a nice thing, right, Mark? I love that. It's fantastic. Okay, before we finish up, Floyd writes, subject, State of Technology episodes on October 3rd and 4th. Having seen some of your appearances on CNET's The 404, I thought your conversation with Jeff Bacalar made for a win. Moreover, I learned a thing or two. Oh, thanks so much, Floyd. Love Jeff Bacalar. If you missed that episode, go to jillonmoney.com because you can go find our previous episodes and you can get all sorts of information. Very easy to do. Jillonmoney.com. And if you're there and you have a question, guess what? You just go to the contact button. It's up in the right corner. You know, make it happen there. All right. Make it happen. Contact us or just send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Okay. Well, as a reminder, it is the beginning of the week and we want to always emphasize the important stuff before we finish the show. Wash your hands, wear your masks, maintain that physical distancing and try to lift somebody up today. It will make you feel better. I promise you that. I really will. Okay. 
We'll talk to you tomorrow. 